Chris, so much to talk about then. We've got the Six Nations starting this weekend, but let's take care of some business first. The Welsh CEO resigning after an investigation. Warren Gatlin's concerns over Netflix. Uh, any reaction up there to the first outed All Black? Um, it came out, um, uh, Campbell Johnston. And, of course, that's big news down here. But the Welsh CEO resigning after an investigation of all kinds of allegations of sexism, misogyny, uh, racism, bigotry, all this kind of thing. Where, how, what, and, and, and how does this end? Well, the only thing he wasn't accused of uh, overseeing was cannibalism. But almost everything else appears to have gone on in the Welsh Rugby Union on his watch or, or when he was part of the uh, Welsh Rugby Union. The handling of this uh, has been uh, chronic. Uh, they've now left Nigel Walker, the former uh, winger, uh, Wales winger and, and athlete, to uh, to pick up the pieces, while Yian Evans, the old Lions wing, is now the chairman, and he's called in a task force of people to find out what's been going on uh, behind the scenes of the World Rugby Union. This, this all came about from uh, a female journalist uh, for the BBC did a brilliant job uh, getting interviews and, and exposing this, and eventually was picked up nationally by the BBC and it's brought about the, the CEO's resignation after he said you know basically nothing to see here move along I'm sure it'll be all right I'll look after it and of course the Welsh government said uh, sorry mate you're out of here and thankfully he went but the damage it's done in what should be an absolutely fantastic week you know build up of Wales versus Ireland you know the messiah not Eddie Jones the real messiah Warren Gatlin's back to uh, save Wales but instead, all we're talking about uh, domestically here is of this absolute shambles of a union. Hey, and so how, how, how bad is it? How deep seated is it? Because when this news broke, I mean, straight away here in New Zealand, you know, we're sitting here thinking, OK, look, there's plenty of skeletons in the closet of the NZR too. I mean, if they really wanted to go through over the last decades or so, uh, you know, some of the stories that have come out, some of the things that have, have been buried and, 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 and slipped to the side there, uh, you know, it just you know, on an employment level, of course. I mean, it's just you know, reprehensible. You can't, you know, you can't defend it at all. But I mean, how much of it is historic? How much of it is what went on before even this guy arrived? And how much of it is just because, hey, right now as a world, we don't tolerate this stuff anymore. Well, look, he was in the Welsh Rugby Union. He wasn't CEO when when the major allegations were of, of on, on, in one instance. Uh, a member of the Welsh Rugby Union uh, staff uh, hearing another member of the staff saying that he'd like to take her take her to his hotel room and rape her. Oh, for God's uh, sake! And they then claimed then claimed that was a joke. Well, of course, you know that what, what a kind hilarious of joke, joke that yeah, was. Yeah, hilarious. Yeah, for God's sake. They, that, then then they um, they appointed uh, Sarah Blanc uh, to be the Wales Professional Rugby Board chairwoman. Uh, and then she was uh, she felt she was not being listened to. Uh, and since leaving the Welsh Rugby Union has been named the Sunday Times Business Person of the Year. Uh, so obviously what she was talking about was actually doing things the right way. But no one in the Welsh Rugby Union wanted to listen to her. Uh, the old thing, uh, get back in the kitchen, appears to have been the sort of attitude of these blazers, these old guys in blazers. And it, it just built up and built up. And now more women are coming forward saying that they had to deal with 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 this awful sort of sexism and sort of neanderthal behavior from people within the welsh Rugby Union. when they did make uh accusations they just weren't listened to they actually have had to admit that the person who made that that rape comment is still working with the welsh Rugby Union. he is still in his job because they said the facts weren't proven and in fact they came to a financial um uh, agreement with the woman who complained uh, about this, but he is still he's still in his job. It it it, it beggars belief, mm. but that's what that's that's a mess they're in at the moment, Marty. It's it, it's unbelievable. All right, okay. Uh, how does it end? How does it unfold from here? Well, what what in every there will be uh, this being organised by the Welsh government independent uh, inquiry. They will no doubt come back with some recommendations about, uh, just as they have done for the Metropolitan Police in London, that there is uh, systematic problems, that they're, they're endemic, that you've got to have a root and branch uh, clear out. Whether they go ahead and do that, uh, it's, it is Turkey's voting for Christmas, because 
A lot of the people in the Welsh Rugby Union have come through the clubs. You know, the big thing in Wales, a bit like it is in New Zealand, you know, you, if you're allowed to join you actually, you know, the council, you're actually on the governing body and representing your small club. It's a big thing. Do you want to give that up? Because, you know, actually somebody says, you know, for the greater good of Welsh Rugby Union, can we please have a professional uh, management and an amateur club management and let's split the two in separately and, and that's what would be the simple thing to do because the four regions in wales have been treated badly as well by the welsh rugby union they still don't know amazingly what monies they're going to get from central funding for next season so they can't actually sign players even though we're halfway through this season they can't actually make offers for next season for players who inevitably and there's one rumour this evening that, that uh, you know, that yet more Welsh players are off to France and England because, you know, they, they just can't rely on contracts from the Welsh Rugby Union because they won't tell the clubs, the professional clubs, who are meant to be sort of the shop window for the game at club level in, 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 in Wales, what monies they're getting next year. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> Second topic then is obviously the Netflix doco and that coincides with what we're talking about, Six Nations Rugby kicking off this weekend and Warren Gatlin rightly voicing his concerns and I thought he made a, you know, a damn good point. No editorial control uh, from the unions, the coach, the players or anyone. This is all Netflix's decisions. And Chris, what they're talking about is they're talking about cameras inside the dressing rooms. We've had this before, but we haven't actually had the full fly on the wall where, where the television company gets to decide uh, what is actually put in their program. Now, look, the language can be ribald. Things can get said. Things can easily be taken out of context from people who sit there and watch, including people like us who work in the media and things like that. Unless you're in those dressing rooms, unless you're feeling those moments. And look, you're talking about a group of men who go out and smash into each other, who physically bash each other. And so there is, there's language, there is phrases used, there's just expressions used that to me probably deserve to stay inside the privacy of those rooms because unless you're in there feeling that, I don't think you can really judge. But what's going to happen here is you know what's going to happen is all of the worst stuff is going to make this doco and all of the screamers and the fluffers and, and the squealers are going to get out there and, and all of a sudden, you know, is there any privacy left in the world and any privacy left in the sanctity of a dressing room where a coach can talk to his players? Well, not if this goes ahead as it's, as it's scheduled to go ahead. And, you know, I spoke to one of the, the players who helped put together the greatest sort of inside story of any uh, rugby tour, and that was the 1997 Lions tour to South Africa with the with the famous speech, you know, this is your Avarice boys, Jim Telfer talking. She, you know, then, but even that one, which was controlled much more than this will be, uh, showed the fight between the two hookers uh, in training uh, you know, and got really inside the, the medical room when, when, when there was a life-threatening injury for Will Greenwood. That was all on the screen. Yeah, and it was an amazing uh, video because no one has seen that sort of access before. But a lot of the best stuff I was told by John Bentley, one of the guys who, who helped doing the filming, the, the Lion's Wing, is that he, Doddy Weir and Rob Wainwright had individual cameras and they went around with these small film cameras and they were doing a lot of the filming because they, they, the guys felt more relaxed around them. Th this is just happening now that the, the players haven't met any of these film crews. They can be embedded with them. They don't know them. They don't trust them. And they're already filming, and none of the parameters are set uh, for the for the coaches. Warren Gatland doesn't know still what will be shown and what won't be shown. So how can he be natural in yeah, the way that he I deals know. with mm. with players? It's yeah, you know, it it sounds like a good idea, but it's been rushed. It hasn't had this. It hasn't had the time and effort put into it to set this up. Also, Marty, what is absolutely ridiculous is by the time this film is released on the Six Nations 2023, it'll be after the Rugby World Cup has been played. Who's going to be interested it, you know, eight, nine months down the road in a tournament that took place after everybody's talking about the World Cup? It's, again, that is absolutely ridiculous. It should have been next year when it's not clashing with, with, with a World Cup. Well, this is look at the you know the woke brigade and the and the you know the social media warriors and, and all of those. Of course, they'll be interested because they want to point fingers at. I mean, do we really want cameras in absolutely every aspect of our lives? And do we really want to know what goes on in those change rooms? I believe that that's their business, and it's not our business to actually be spying on that and be listening to it. You know, look, I don't mind the old camera that you know at half time when you can, but you don't actually hear what's being said, because look, it's like if you have. 
you know, some people around for a game of cards or something at home. Do you really want to live your life as the Truman Show with cameras on everything? You know, sometimes we make jokes about things. Sometimes we say things. Sometimes things get said that oh, other people might take offense of. But if you actually understand the context or you actually understand who's saying it or, or whatever. But that's never the consideration these days, is it? It's just basically take it, isolate it, separate it, and then make a hell of a big deal of it. I, th I think this is a, a massive mistake. And, you know, whoever decided that this was a good idea for rugby in the Six Nations is a moron because I think that the way the world is at the moment, that all of this is going to be completely taken out of context and it's going to make these players and coaches look a lot worse. Gatlin's got every right to be fearful of this. It will cost jobs, well, Chris, in the end, yeah. is what it's well, going to do. Well, you know why they're doing it. They're doing it for money. Yeah. The game up here is desperate for money, just like it is around the rest of the world, and that's why they've accepted this deal. They've looked at what happened with F1, with the drive to survive, and, and yes, you know, people have got really interested in Formula One because of the inside stories, because you never got those sort of stories out of the pit lane that you do now. But that's because you're talking you're talking about real personalities, you know, bouncing off each other, and they were selling themselves to the film crew. They were saying, this is F1, come and enjoy it. You know, they needed to, because they, they're such a, a large organization, they need to get as much money in as possible. So that's why F1 sold itself. So it's basically sold its soul, and it did very well out of it. Everybody else is trying to jump on the bandwagon, believing they can get the same impact and have the same positive elements to this and also the very nice money coming in. And that's why the Six Nations has gone running towards this concept, that they're going to suddenly broaden the appeal of the game by revealing all its, its underbelly. And, you know, it just doesn't sound like it's going to work to me. It really doesn't. Chris Jones, uh, so... Times, times online, rugbypass.com. A couple of topics to finish with. Obviously, we've got the uh, Six Nations kicking off this weekend. England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland. I mean, those are the two big games. So very much looking forward to this international rugby again, a World Cup year. Reaction to Campbell Johnston coming out uh, on New Zealand television. And I know that this has happened before. I mean, you've had your own you know, Welsh players who've done this. Is it continuing to be a big deal um, obviously, you know, the media down here, very slow uh, sports news days. We've got a hell of a lot of flooding and other news, but, you know, every every single story seems to have been about this. Look, and I don't want to sound flippant about it, but I'm just a bit ambivalent now, Chris. I mean, I just kind of think, okay, that's cool. I mean, it just, I mean, because, because I, I don't consider myself a racist or a bigot, so it just doesn't really doesn't really bother me, you know, I, whether, you know, I've always thought, of course there's going to be gay rugby players and gay all blacks, just by statistics you would think that there is. But, you know, the way that it's treated down here, it's almost like the whole world needs to stop and the whole world has to sort of, you know, reconfigure itself afterwards. You know, if you didn't know who Campbell Johnston was, you probably wouldn't remember, to be honest. And no disrespect, mate, that he was an all-black. I mean, he's been a great crusader servant and everything else. And I was saying yesterday that I hope that that's how he's remembered. Because, you know, I'm not sure that when this happens, it actually does encourage anyone else to, to come out or to be honest about it, given the fact that the blaze of publicity, it just, and, it, and you get painted into a corner that, you know, the media, that that's all you are. Whereas I'm sure with Campbell, I don't know the bloke, but I'm sure he wants to be considered as a fantastic mate, a fantastic servant, a great teammate, a great crusader, a great cantab, played three tests for the All Blacks. I don't know, isn't that more important than who he sleeps with as long as it's a consensual act between adults? Yeah, well, also, what it is a big invitation to, isn't it, for every troll to get off to get off their bed, move over to their to their uh, overused uh, computer, and to send him some bilge and some vile uh, comments, and that's what you are when you are the first of anything. And and the reason this has made uh, headlines over here is because he is the first All Black, and that's that's the tag that's going to be with him uh, forever now that he was the first All Black to come out and say, right, you know, I'm gay. I mean. Exeter have a second row called Jack Dunn. He is, in two years ago, he announced that he was bisexual. He's playing first team rugby with Exeter. No one, no one cares a jot about it. It's just Jack and he's getting on with it. And that's how it should be. And, and yeah, and I, I, I get that it's unusual because it's the first Orba, but then the first South African or the first Australian or the first Argentinian who does this, they, they will get publicity because they're the first. The important thing is now is that the second, third and fourth people who, who decide to, to go public, if you need to do that, if you need to go public, I'm sure teammates know already and you, you, you're you living your life normally because they're mates and they just get on with you and accept you for who you are. But if you feel the need to come out and say this, fine, but accept that you're going to take an awful lot of flack from people who do not probably have the same attitude to you that your mates do 
who are, who are in the changing shacks, sheds every week with you and, and enjoy playing with you because you're a good player, not because you're you're straight or gay. And yeah, OK, I don't quite know why he's chosen to do it now. Mentally, if he needed to do it, fine. But honestly, the negatives that come with this are some of the reasons why there's an awful lot of interest in this, because people are obviously thinking, crikey, mate, if you... If you're saying this now, you're going to bring a, yeah, a ton of hurt on you, as well as an awful lot of, of, of quite right, a lot of pats on the back. And it, it is an interesting balance, isn't it? You know, when you make that decision, as Gareth Thomas did, and Gareth, yeah, took an awful lot of flack because he came out and said, "Look, yeah, I, okay, guys, I'm gay," but he, yeah, he's had to live with that, and it still affects him now. He's just had a court case which he settled out of court over over an accusation over, over HIV, etc. But again, he's he's constantly described as Gareth Thomas, you know, the first openly gay rugby player, and th- this is what uh, is going to happen now. Yeah, that's what You're concerns the first me. New Zealander. Yeah, that's what concerns me the most. You know that you know does he want to be defined by that? Because and this is where I point the finger at the mass media and say, you know, that's take some responsibility because you know you don't have to label Gareth Thomas that, but they do, don't they? Because it's a clickbait headline these days, and so you know that's that's why they do it. And so Campbell Johnson. You know, I just wonder whether the poor bloke, you know, change your phone number, mate, because otherwise you're going to get pestered by every single dickhead in the place who works in the media that any time there's a comment needed, they're going to come to you, you know, and whether or not he actually wants. Look, he's, you know, it's up to him to do what he wants to in his life. But, you know, I can understand watching him the other night because he looked a bit reticent at times and he looked a bit bewildered at times in front of those cameras. And I just thought I can understand why people don't want actually to have their private lives made public because of the nature of the world that we live in now. And, you know, and and, 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 and and the social media aspect of it, which is quite destructive. Well, you're absolutely right now. He is going to be defined by that one interview. And I'm sure there's a hell of a lot more to his life and a hell of a lot more he's yes. done. Uh, but it, from now on, he is the first. And that is by making that decision to come out, and it is brave because you do take an awful lot of flack for it, does define you from now on. And... Uh, yeah, it's a very. I, I I can't think what what mental turmoil he must have gone through just to just to make this decision. But I tell you what, the mental turmoil he's going to face now is probably just as bad because people will not l- let him forget.